because my distinct honor to once again uh, administer the oath to our second panel of the first day of the citizens hearing. Uh, this panel uh, will run until approximately 1245. We'll have opening statements of 10 to 15 minutes maximum and then questions of five to seven minutes. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Dillon, you've already been um, uh, shared the oath, uh, so it's your option whether to do it again, but if the rest of the panel could repeat after me, I do hereby affirm I do hereby affirm, affirm that I will tell the truth and nothing but the truth to the members of this committee today. Thank you. We are for the second time this morning honored to begin with Mr. Dolan. My goodness. Uh, thank you, uh, esteemed members of the committee. And uh, I will keep my remarks a little um, more mercifully brief than the last time. Um, and I apologize for not having uh, this statement for you. I will provide that for you for the record uh, before, we're, before we're done here. Um, I just want to point out that re researchers of UFO phenomenon have long argued with each other over many uh, aspects of this phenomenon. Uh, but one conclusion that I think all of us share, uh, at least serious research, is that, is that it's become, that UFOs have become a central, although covert, but a central component of US history in the modern era, and indeed of world history. But as everyone knows, you, you can't have much of a history that is a reliable, factually based history without access to documents. And it's the documents of the past that enable us in the present to try to puzzle through the complexities and to find solid ground, as it were. And yet it's easy for us to forget that access to most of the key UFO documents we now have came to us by way of historical accident. And it happened to be a fleeting one at that. All through the 1940s and 1950s and 1960s and, and well into the 1970s, there were many thousands of classified pages written about UFOs. And of course, the general public didn't know about this, and neither, it appears, did many, or maybe even most members of Congress. But then came the end of the war in Vietnam, and of course, Watergate. And this was a, a certain key moment in American history, a moment in which the United States Congress investigated the intelligence community, for example, um, and when it reopened the, uh, assass the investigation of the assassination of President John F. Kennedy and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and others. And it was a moment in which Congress dramatically strengthened the United States Freedom of Information Act, uh, enabling US citizens to petition their government for documents not merely relating to them personally, but to the nation in terms of broad issues of public policy. Well, little did members of Congress realize that of all subsequent Freedom of Information Act requests, the most popular category would be related to UFOs. And indeed, during the late 1970s, over 10,000 pages of documents relating to UFOs were released. Uh, the party lasted until about 1982 when a presidential order by Ronald Reagan made FOIA substantially less user-friendly and did not require many agencies to reply in a timely manner at all. Uh, the result was a major ballooning in costs to those people making requests. So the glory era of freedom of information documents, at least pertaining to UFOs, came to an end. To this day, more than half of all US declassified UFO documents come from that period of time, over 30 years ago. Great for the Carter administration, shame on the subsequent ones. Uh, and yet we remain fortunate, I think, because the documents that we have, thank goodness, give us at least enough. They give us enough of a history to hold on to. They give us enough solid ground. And their aggregate message is startlingly clear. UFOs have been the subject not merely of interest to our nation's military and intelligence community. But at times, at times, a subject of concern and even alarm. Um, but how could it be otherwise when we have report after report of violations of sensitive airspace by objects that defy any logical or conventional explanation? Whether the scene was Los Alamos uh, during 1948 and 1949 or 
Oak Ridge uh, Laboratories from 1948 through much of the 1950s or the many military bases during the 50s, 60s, and 70s that reported such events. Uh, the question remains, how could this not be a matter of grave concern to those parties responsible for maintaining the integrity of their airspace? And not surprisingly, we find the tone of their memos and requests for information to be appropriate uh, to the matter at hand. Here is one CIA memo from 1949 puts the matter in this very succinct way, quote, information is desired if this was some new or experimental aircraft or for any explanation whatsoever. And I think these statements are in fact typical. And in, the situation became so stressful to the CIA and elsewhere that on December 2nd, 1952, this is right at the very end of the Truman presidency, the CIA's Chief of Scientific Intelligence, H. Marshall Chadwell, wrote a classified memo to his boss, that was the director of the CIA, uh, Walter Beadle Smith. And a key paragraph in this memo is as follows. At this time, the reports of incidents convince us that there is something going on that must have immediate attention sightings of unexplained objects at great altitudes and traveling at high speeds in the vicinity of major U.S. defense installations are of such nature that they are not attributable to natural phenomena or known types of aerial vehicles." End quote. I think this is a statement that bears very close scrutiny. Here is yet another comment by a high-level U.S. official that UFOs were real, probably artificial, probably intelligently operated, and not apparently ours. And nor was there serious consideration that these were Soviet. So I would ask, if not American, if not Soviet, if not natural phenomena, and if they appeared to be technological and under intelligent control, well, we begin to run out of viable options. It is access to documents such as these that enable us to know with certainty that UFOs were a matter of serious concern to individuals at the highest levels of US national security. They, you know, I would want to stress that I don't think any of the formally declassified documents we have by themselves prove that UFOs are ET. I don't think any of them do. Um, but I, I would argue that if you take the top 50, even the top 10, that they make a very powerful case, I would say not even a matter of speculation, but a matter of proof that, that the phenomenon was considered real by the responsible members of our uh, national security community. That, I would say, is not a matter of debate or speculation. And really, the questions that we need to ask is, why were they considering it? And did they form any opinions themselves? And getting at that answer is a little more difficult. But nonetheless, the bottom line is, these documents do prove this. And it's important because all of these levels of concern were consistently voiced within the classified world, but they were not given out publicly all through the 40s and 50s, and right up to our own era. The, the, the formal public statements are always the same. That there's nothing to this, that it may be interesting or may not, but we don't, we're not interested in it. We don't do UFOs. And uh, fortunately, as, as the historical accident of freedom of information turned out, those documents proved the lie to those statements of denial. So today, official pronouncements about UFOs by the government and military it follows the exact same tone. There's really no difference between what they say now and what they said 50 years ago, except they're a little less um, insulting about it. You know, back, back in the early years, a number of statements that talked about people just kind of being crazy, psychopathological, and all. you don't hear that anymore. But other than that, it's really the same type of tone. Unfortunately, though, the, we don't have the kind of access to classified information on UFOs as we once briefly obtained in the past. And yet enough genuine and recent UFO accounts have become known to us, many of which involve US military, that we can see that very little has changed 
something important is happening behind the veil of the classified world. My question to you is how long will current members of Congress and the public at large be content to roll over and be spoon-fed nonsense by responsible officials when in fact they deserve the truth? Thank you. Good afternoon or good morning, distinguished members of, and panelists of the citizen hearing on unidentified flying objects, UFOs. My name is Jose Antonio Neus and I'm a Chilean American journalist who has been actively involved in covering the mystery of UFOs and its hypothesis of extraterrestrial ET origin. Other theories are also possible and should be considered for the past 37 years. My very first article on this topic was published in a small New York newspaper on July 4, 1977, coinciding with the beginning of my professional career as a journalist in the United States. I was born in this country, but my family was from Chile. My father worked for several years in the United Nations in the early formative years of this international body, during which time I was born in New York in 1950. After graduating from high school in Santiago in 1969, I went to Europe and took a semester on French language and civilization at the Sorbonne University in Paris, and later studied journalism at the University of Chile in Santiago. I worked for a while as a science journalist for a weekly magazine in Santiago and also wrote regularly for a daily newspaper in the mid-70s, where I was one of the first journalists in Chile to cover ecological or green issues on a regular basis. This was, however, a period of great turmoil in Chile following the military coup of September 11, 1973, the first time that fateful date shows up in modern history. I might add, uh, I might add, so I took the decision to claim my U.S. citizenship and move to this country where I have lived ever since. First in the Washington, D.C. area, then New York for some 25 years, back to the Beltway where I lived in Northern Virginia for about three years, and now the Phoenix, Arizona area where I moved in 2009 after I was hired to work as a full-time paid journalist and editor of Open Minds magazine and also a writer for our website, openminds.tv, and other production and research activities in ufology for the company Open Minds Production. The subject of UFOs is a contentious one where many different views and attitudes coexist, sometimes in a friendly manner, sometimes in a more acrimonious way. But there is no doubt in my mind that there is at least one conclusion we can, we can and should all agree. UFOs are definitely a global phenomenon. They are sighted visually on film and on radar, reported, investigated sometimes officially, sometimes by private organizations, and covered by both the local and international media all over the world. It doesn't really matter what is the culture, language, religion, ethnic origin, and level of development and technological capabilities of a country. UFOs have been reported everywhere, from Alaska to Chile and Argentina and the Americas, all over Europe, Asia, the Middle East, Africa, Australia, and the oceans. There are well-documented cases in many parts of the world, including Brazil, France, Iran, Russia, Zimbabwe, New Zealand, and many other countries. Regardless of what turns out to be the final origin of this mystery, it has a great potential of unifying the different and often divided parts of our world. The reason is simple. No matter how big our ideological, religious, or cultural differences are, we would all tend to unite in the face of an unknown, possibly extraterrestrial presence. It is for this reason that some efforts have been made over the years to bring the subject to the attention of the United Nations organization. This international body, despite its flaws, is the only organization that truly represents all the nations of the world. And so it seems to be the logical place where this issue could be dealt with in a global, formal, and legal manner. I will outline briefly the history of UFOs at the United Nations, a subject that I know very well firsthand since I personally attended as a journalist 
the famous historical UFO hearing before the UN Special Political Committee on November 27, 1978. This was the result of a two-year lobbying effort by Sir Eric Gehry, the Prime Minister of Grenada, a small Caribbean island which had gained independence from Great Britain in 1978. I'm submitting for the record a long article detailing the history of UFOs at the UN, which I published in the third issue of Open Minds magazine in 2010. Grenada's UFO proposal, uh, proposal was first raised officially by Prime Minister Gary and Grenada's UN Ambassador Wellington Friday at a meeting of the UN General Assembly Special Political Committee on November 28, 1977. Grenada proposed the, quote, establishment of an agency or a department of the United Nations for undertaking, coordinating, and disseminating the results of research into unidentified flying objects, UFOs, and related phenomena. Grenada made further statements on November 30 and December 6, 1977. In an earlier speech in October, Prime Minister Gary disclosed his own sighting, quote, I have myself seen an unidentified flying object, and I have been totally overwhelmed by what I have seen. As a result of all this effort, on December 13, 1977, the General Assembly adopted Decision 32-424, which acknowledged the draft, res the draft resolution submitted by Grenada. Secretary General Kurt Valheim duly forwarded Decision 32-424 to the member states by a note verbal on March 13, 1978. However, only three governments responded, India, Luxembourg, and Seychelles, and only two specialized agencies, International Civil Aviation Organization and UNESCO, replied with a flat no comments to offer. Undeterred, Grenada launched a new offensive in 1978 with the help of one of the original NASA astronauts, Gordon Cooper, among others. A group of recognized experts was assembled by Gary to testify at a hearing before the Special Political Committee on November 27, 1978, which became the high point of the Grenada Initiative. Besides Sir Eric Gary and Ambassador Friday, who was now Grenada's Minister of Education, the hearing included testimony by astronomer Dr. J. Allen Hynek, the former scientific consultant for the U.S. Air Force Project Blue Book, who went on to found the Center for UFO Studies, CUFOS, Dr. Jacques Vallée, Stanton Friedman, who is present at the citizen hearing, and a first-hand witness account by Lieutenant Colonel Lawrence Coyne of the U.S. Army Reserve on the famous October 18, 1973 UFO helicopter near collision in Ohio. A letter of endorsement by astronaut Gordon Cooper, who was then working for the Walt Disney Company as Vice President of Research and Development for Epcot, was read into the record. Besides mentioning his own sighting and views on UFOs, Cooper wrote that, quote, we need to have a top-level coordinated program to scientifically collect and analyze data from all over Earth concerning any type of encounter and to determine how best to interface with these visitors in a friendly fashion, end quote. At a meeting of the UN General Assembly on December 18, 1978, decision 33-426 was adopted with the same heading to the previous decision 32-424 establishment of an agency or a department of the United Nations for undertaking, coordinating, and disseminating the results of research into unidentified flying objects and related phenomena." End quote. The Grenada Initiative was gradually opening the door to UFOs at the UN, but unfortunately the effort came to an abrupt halt when the Gary government was overthrown by a Marxist revolution led by Maurice Bishop of the New Jewel Movement in March 1979. Ironically, Gary was in New York to meet with Kurt Valheim regarding Decision 33-426 when the coup took place. Some minor efforts to rekindle the UFO initiative at the United Nations were attempted by civilian investigators since the Grenada coup of 1979, but with no success whatsoever 
because only a sovereign member country can bring this issue back officially to the UN, and no government has done so since the Grenada Initiative of the late 70s. The good news, however, is that we don't have to reinvent the wheel. The UN decisions 32.424 and 33.426 are already on the books and could be revived if there was political will. In closing these opening remarks, I want to make a few important points. While it's true that the majority of UFO sightings have mundane explanations, a fact recognized by most competent investigators and scientists, if you really study with an open mind the extensive data bank of UFO cases collected worldwide during the last six decades, you will find a small percentage of truly puzzling incidents that defy any conventional explanation. The prevailing view among most researchers and the media is that these cases have an ET origin, but this is not the only explanation. Other theories, including interdimensional or multiple universes, have also been advanced. Even time travel has been proposed. In other words, UFOs would be our own devices from the future coming back in time for unknown reasons. I realize all this sounds like science fiction, but think for a minute. Didn't you see people talking to each other at huge distances while viewing themselves on a screen in lots of sci-fi movies from the 50s and 60s? Well, this happens now every day through Skype and the internet. Similar examples can be multiplied ad infinitum. What is important is to look at all the data without any preconceived ideas or beliefs. The late Dr. Heinig used to say that UFOs were likely signaling the next scientific revolution. But we, but we will never get there if we don't study the phenomenon in a truly comprehensive and unbiased way, and I might add, with the proper resources to do so. The political implications, or exopolitical as is now referred, are even bigger. The alien can become a catalyst to unify the people of Earth to realize that mankind must grow way beyond our current limitations if we are going to survive and prosper in the future. Many believe the open, that open contact will never happen in an open way unless mankind's level of consciousness makes a significant jump. Let me finish with an appropriate quote from Shakespeare's Hamlet. There are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, that are dreamt in your philosophy. Thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Congresswoman and uh, Congressman and uh, Senator Gravel. My name is Dan Sheehan. Uh, I am general counsel for the committee. Uh, I've been asked to speak briefly here today to address a, a few different instances that have occurred in my career as an attorney uh, that bear upon this particular subject that have led to me ending up being general counsel. I was also general counsel for the original disclosure uh, conference that we had in 2001. So I've been around for a while uh, on this particular area. And it, it arose because uh, I was uh, chief counsel for the United States Jesuit headquarters in Washington, D.C. here back in 1976 when President Carter uh, was elected president. And uh, immediately after his election in November of 1976, President Carter called into his office the then uh, Central Intelligence Agency director, who was George H.W. Uh, uh, Bush. And uh, President Carter asked to be briefed by the director of Central Intelligence on the issue of uh, UFOs. <coughs> and in that meeting, uh, CIA Director Bush asked the president-elect if uh, the president-elect would leave him in as the Central Intelligence Agency director. Uh, and that he would promise that he would never run for political office in his life if uh, Carter would agree to keep him in as the director of the CIA. Uh, Bush wanted to, at that time, become more or less like J. Edgar Hoover had become at the FBI, that he would remain, that it would be above politics, that he would remain in that position. Uh, President Carter uh, reiterated his request for the UFO information, saying that uh, he had his own a person in mind to be the director of the Central Intelligence Agency, which happened to be Teddy Sorensen uh, at the time. 
Uh, and uh, Bush at that time then refused to provide the information to him, saying that uh, he did not have adequate clearances, uh, he was not the president yet, and that he should ask his own Central Intelligence Agency director for that. Uh, but if he wanted to have the information ahead of time, that what he could do is he could contact the Science and Technology Committee of the House of Representatives. And uh, they had an ongoing relationship with the Science and Technology Division of the Congressional Research Service that could go about getting things declassified to show him. That is what generated the request from the Congressional Research Service to me uh, as the general counsel for the Jesuit headquarters in the United States uh, asking if I could gain access to the Vatican Library to obtain the information that the Vatican has in its library and its classified sections to deliver to the president for his review. Uh, I, I did that. I contacted the, the Jesuit, who happens to be the head of the, the Vatican Library, uh, requesting this information. And much to my surprise, I was denied information. I wrote a second letter to them saying, look, I, I, I guess you must not know who we are here. Uh, this is the Jesuit headquarters in the United States. We have 10 provinces here in the United States, more than any other country in the world. Uh, and we're requesting this information to share with the president. They still declined. So I had to report that to Marcia Smith, who was the head of the Science and Technology Division of the, Li the Library of Congress Congressional Research Service. And she asked if I would be willing to become counsel, special counsel, to this investigation that was being conducted by the, by the Science and Technology Committee. I agreed to do this. And uh, I told her that I would need to have access to certain kinds of information that I would like to have declassified or get to see it. And she said, what would you like to see? And I said, well, the first thing I'd like to see is the classified sections of Project Blue Book those sections that have been referred to by Mr. Dolan uh, earlier and, uh, and by Gordon as not really available. Uh, much to our surprise, I was granted permission to see them. And they, they brought them to Washington and they brought them over to the Jefferson Building, the extension to the Congressional Library before it was even open, the brand new building that they built across the street. Remember? And so I was invited to come over there. I went over there, no one else was in the building. They had security people at the door. Uh, I went over and I was uh, brought downstairs into a, a room where they had these shoe boxes uh, with, with, uh, with microfilm in them and documents, et cetera. And in my review of those documents, I came upon photographs of unquestioned uh, UFOs. It wasn't any question about what they were. It wasn't a light in the sky. It wasn't a vague report about having seen something going very fast by. These were photographs, official United States Air Force photographs, some taken through gun sites, uh, but another one of a crashed saucer on the ground. That it was, there was snow in the, in the photographs. It showed a, a, uh, a pl the, the, the saucer had hit into a field and had plowed across the field and was stuck into a snowbank set up si about a 45 degree angle. And I could see in the photographs US uh, Air Force personnel dressed in heavy parkas, uh, taking, video, taking actually film with those two cameras with the great big uh, camera circles on top the films like this, so it must have been in the 1950s. Uh, and I, I saw this and I realized that I could see in one of the photographs symbols that were on the, the dome of the, the UFO sticking in the snowbank. So what I did, I, we had, I had one of those, uh, they were the microfiche, those little machines you put the microfiche in, you crank the little handle, very high tech this was. <laughs> And so what, what I did is they had told me that I wasn't allowed to take any notes when, when I went in there. The, the, two, the two security men at the door told me I was not allowed to take any notes, but I, I actually had a yellow pad uh, under, my, under my arm when I went in like this. And so when I went in and when I saw these photographs, what I did is I, I cranked down the, the focus on the, uh, on the machine so that I could get a close-up view of these symbols that were around the dome of the, of the UFO. And what I did is I opened up the yellow pad and I put the yellow pad in there and I traced the actual symbols that were along the base of the, of the saucer. And then I closed it up and I said, 
I think I'd probably better leave now because uh, I have this. So what I did is I, I put all the stuff back into the boxes and I put the little yellow pad under my arm and I walked back out and the two security guys said, I, I'd like my briefcase back. They handed me my briefcase and I started to walk away. And one of them says, what's that under your arm? And I said, oh, this is a yellow pad. And he opened it up and he leafed through all the pages and there was nothing there. And so, because I had put it on the inside of the cardboard. Uh, and so I, I took that back with me to Jesuit headquarters, and uh, I brought it to Father Bill Davis, who was my superior at the Jesuit headquarters, and we then agreed to go. We gathered the, all 54 of the major religious denominations, their Washington, D.C. offices, and we brought them into a meeting, and we proposed to them from the Jesuit national headquarters that we establish as a priority having the churches try to ascertain what information we could get and that we would get the backing of the churches and then go to the Vatican Library and see if we could start to address this. Now, that is, that is what we did. And Father Bill Davis, when I, when I asked him this, he, he got puzzled, and he reached down, and he, he pulled open the drawer out of, his, out of his desk at the Jesuit headquarters, right over by DuPont Circle, 1717 Mass Ave is where we were. And he opened up the drawer, and he pulled out a photograph. And he said, this is a photograph that I got from my sister, her husband is, a, uh, is in the, the, the tower in the Seattle, Washington airport. He's a, he's a flight controller, and his best friend is a, a commercial pilot, and he took this photograph out of his window of the commercial airline, and he handed me the photograph of this. So we showed this to the people at the Washington Interreligious Staff Council that we organized, asking them if they would make this a priority. And they, they uh, said, are there any other subjects you'd like to discuss instead of that? Uh, that they didn't want to address that at that time. And what happened, I was contacted then by Marcia Smith, who was directing the investigation for President Carter at the Congressional Research Service. And she asked me if I would go to meet with the people at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in California in the SETI program, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, and give them a briefing on the theological implications of contact with extraterrestrial intelligence. So I was privileged to deliver a three-hour seminar to the top 50 scientists in the, the SETI program on the theological implications of contact with an extraterrestrial intelligence. And then in 1994, I was contacted by Dr. John Mack, who was the chairman of the Department of Clinical Psychiatry at Harvard Medical School, because I'd graduated from Harvard College and graduated from Harvard Law School, where I was one of the founders of the Harvard Civil Rights Law Review. And I had gone on to Harvard Divinity School. Uh, and he contacted me and asked me if I would represent him, because he had written a book based upon his, his uh, clinical uh, assistance to high-level military officials and others in the country who had been sent to have psychological background done on them who had reported these direct contacts with extraterrestrial vehicles of this kind. And when I met with him, he had written this book and the, the faculty committee at Harvard University had called him into a session with the, with the legal counsel from Harvard University and the head of the, the dean of the, of the medical school getting ready to challenge his, his tenure for his having written this book, that it was undermining the worldview of Harvard University. And uh, so I, we met with uh, Lawrence Rockefeller, and Lawrence Rockefeller agreed to fund what would really amount to a grand rounds uh, to present to the Harvard faculty all of the basic information that we had on the existence of UFOs. And uh, they then uh, dropped the hearings and said they didn't, they didn't want to have this hearings turned into a circus. Now, those, those were my initial contacts with them, and so I, I have delivered a number of uh, presentations to the International UFO Congress over the, the, the years uh, on the theological implications of contact with an extraterrestrial civilization. And as you may know, the Vatican has now uh, started to issue press statements. They actually held a major press conference talking about the fact that in light of the more recent discoveries, of the increasing number of planets that they now realize have suns and atmosphere and are in what they call the Goldilocks zone. It's clo they're close enough to their planet, their, their sun in the, in the solar, their solar systems, but not so far away that they're likely to have potential life on them. 
And as these plans began to multiply, the Vatican has now held an official press conference announcing that they, in fact, have now taken the position that the discovery of extraterrestrial intelligence in a highly technologically developed intelligence is not inconsistent with Catholic theology. And that is, that is what is going on right now. There are very high-level meetings going on right now with the new pope to discuss what positions are going to be taken by the, by the International Catholic Church with regard to the theology. My, my understanding is, as former chief counsel for the Jesuits, that the fact is that the Catholic Church does not want to be behind the power curve on this issue. And they realize that with the increasing contact and discovery of these additional planets, that it's going to become clear within our generation, within our lifetimes, that in fact, highly technologically developed uh, extraterrestrial intelligence actually exists. And the findings of the Congressional Research Service that were delivered to the president, uh, to President Carter, is that based upon all of their analysis, that they have come to the conclusion, this is an official conclusion of the Congressional Research Service, that they have come to a 95% probability projection that there are from two to 10 highly technologically developed extraterrestrial civilizations within our own galaxy. Now, and remember, in closing, there in our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, there are 50 billion star systems in our galaxy. And there are 50 billion trillion galaxies that are now known. The question, and the abiding question, and it's the one that you and I discussed uh, last night, Congressman Barlett, have these vehicles developed the capacity to transport vehicles beyond the speed of light. Because if they have, then all these questions now become focused. That that means that they would be able to be here, come here, and go. And if they have, then all of these sightings that we've talked about, all these hundreds of witnesses that we've talked about, then are talking about a very real phenomenon. And I'll close with this one observation. When I was, I was legal counsel for the Iran-Contra uh, investigations, that we were the ones that actually initially discovered the uh, Iran-Contra weapons supply uh, trafficking. And when I delivered this information to Peter Rodino, who was at the time the chair of the Judiciary Committee of the House through Scott Armstrong. Scott Armstrong, as you'll recall, was the staff person on Rodino's uh, staff of the Judiciary Committee during the Watergate investigations who discovered the taping system in the White House that Alexander Butterfield revealed this to, to Scott. So I went and brought this information to him, and because of his close relationship with Peter Rodino, he delivered all of the information we had about the off-the-shelf enterprise, the involvement of Poindexter and everyone else. And the response of Peter Rodino was, he said, Scott, he said, my God, he said, if what you're telling me is true about this off-the-shelf enterprise going on delivering these weapons contrary to the orders of Congress, why then, he said, I've been telling my constituencies that they didn't like the way that American policy was going, that they should write a letter to their congressperson. And if their congressperson didn't do what they wanted them to do, you should vote for someone else for Congress. But if what you're telling me is true, Scott, my God, we haven't even been in control. I'm not going to allow the Congress of the United States to investigate anything like that. And that's the issue that's before us now. Because if, in fact, we're not in ultimate control, and there is an extraterrestrial intelligence of this type of sophistication that's been visiting our planet and entering our airspace and outmaneuvering our aircraft, it's perfectly clear that from a political consciousness that abides inside our executive branch and inside our legislature, that is not something that they want to share with the American people because it would ultimately undermine the confidence of the governed in their governors. My name is Lieutenant Colonel Richard French. I am one of the writers of the original Air Force Blue Book. I was a student at Oregon State starting in 1947, and in my junior year, I was asked what specialty I wanted to be assigned when I graduated. An advisor told me about the Office of Special Investigations, 
It sounded like an exciting and glamorous job, so I volunteered. Brigadier General Carroll, and F a former FBI director of the, of the Washington District, was commissioned as an Air Force general and assumed command of uh, the OSI. Uh, the OSI, of course, was also given the added responsibility of investigating the phenomenon of unidentified flying objects. The OSI assignment required that I have the final top secret clearance granted before I could even report for duty. That caused a delay in my reporting because I, in fact, am adopted and all of my uh, medical and, and birth records and all that are sealed. After a year, they straightened out that mess, and I reported to DO-20 at McCord Air Force Base, Washington. There, my training officer was a special agent named John Drejos. Under his supervision, I began investigating UFO reports and re recording the incidents in the Air Force's Blue Book. The most controversial uh, UFO incident that occurred in my early training and deserves special mention because of its unique factor. An F-100D pilot had was, uh, well, they launch uh, the Ds, they launch them normally in just in twos rather than fours like tactical fighters. Anyway, uh, he pulled up on this UFO and it was a, approximately uh, 30 yards directly behind the thing. The, uh, the F-86 today carries a total of 36, what, two and a half uh, inch, or two and a half, let me get this straight, uh, carries 36 of those uh, two and a half inch uh, uh, rockets, and they're carried in a pod that drops, and it drops and automatically fires when it comes down. Well, he got the clearance to fire, which kind of surprised everybody, and but he blew that uh, UFO out of the sky. But the, the problem is that, uh, that his, the, uh, the recording of the incident, well, let me get this exactly right. The UFO intercept violated the prohibited zone at Hanford's atomic energy facility. He was a wingman and pulled up straight ahead and was given a clearance to fire. When the, when the weapon fired, the pod dropped, but his airplane exploded. They, uh, they drug the Colorado River, I mean the Columbia River, uh, in a 60-mile area, and they never found a piece or a part or any, anything even pertaining to it. And now the, I mentioned that uh, I had just a, a very fast look at the magic report. Uh, I hope you people are familiar with it, but if you're not, it is the original report that was uh, prepared. Uh, President Truman was the chairman. The people who were on that committee, and I just did just get a very quick look at it, but I could easily remember who they were because of who they were. They, they included the chiefs of the president, of course, and also the chiefs of staff of all of the armed forces, arms of the United States. In other words, the Na chief of naval operations and the head of the Coast Guard and on and on. And that uh, terminates my presentation. We have about 10 minutes for each member uh, of the six of you, and that'll take us to 12.50. And I've been asked by both the chair and the co-chair to give time reminders uh, as we're approaching that 10-minute limit for each of you. So I'll do that okay. as gently Thank as possible. My understanding is that there will be time cue cards visible to the uh, panelists here and to uh, the members back here. So we will watch those and, 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 and time ourselves. I remember a number of years ago, I was traveling in a car and had my car radio on, and there were two news accounts. One was that there were some UFO sightings over New Mexico. And the other was that uh, there had been two mysterious deaths in New York City that might have been psittacosis. And if it was psittacosis, it might have come from dried pigeon manure. So there's a serious suggestion that maybe we ought to kill all the pigeons in New York. 
Well, I listened to those two newscasts, and I thought, gee, if these flying saucers are extraterrestrial, I think I'd wander around a bit up there and watch for a while yet before I landed. Uh, you know, it, it, as I said when we started this, it is really enormously arrogant and presumptive to believe that we're the most advanced uh, civilization in the universe. We still fight stupid wars and kill each other. There just has to be a better way, doesn't there? Oh, Again, I will reserve my question till the end. Uh, my co-chair. I, I wanted to mention one other thing. All of the time, and there's a period there, it's about 12 years, but during that 12-year period, my primary job as a member of the OSI was to debunk them. In other words, I, I'd come up with any kind of explanation. We'd say it was swamp gas or <laughs> you name it. Anything that we could come up with to apparently convince the general public and maintain the secrecy level on that. And it, some of my answers, I, I swear, were absurd. But uh, the swamp gas, for instance, there were, at that time, there was an average of about three a week UFOs that descended into the Gulf Breeze, uh, Florida area, if you know where that is. It's just the, the, where the panhandle is in Florida. Anyway, I went down there and we observed them just regularly, just sit there every evening with a cocktail, and in they'd come. <laughs> and, but, I, but what was it? It was swamp gas. That's what, that was my lie, and I made good on it. <laughs> but that was my actual job. <laughs> Be the most it. artful lawyer on earth. <laughs> Thank so, you very much. So, uh, Colonel French, you did a good job of it, obviously. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. So for all four of you, I have this, it's just starting to weigh on me. If um, transparency would reveal that uh, we really aren't in control, uh, that there are actually as intelligent or more, like, more than likely, more intelligent life, life form than humans, um, and that in so knowing and admitting would be dangerous, how do we, uh, that's a closed circle, folks. So what do you recommend, how do you recommend we handle this? Let's start with, uh, the colonel who won't tell us it's a, a, a gas form. Well, I, I see no other way to attack it than to come up with some kind of international organization, something along the line of what we already have in him, or a, some similar governmental way, and then putting those people, you know, because when you, when you think about it, this confronts religion directly and very firmly. Yeah. And uh, there, we, we do need some type of organization, something that can hold us, uh, if need be, to contact uh, these people from another universe. That, when they come, like, you know, it's a lot better if you say, hi, buddy, not try and shoot their tail end off. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, so uh, reclaiming my time to go on to you, uh, that, Daniel. That, uh, but let me yeah. add a, a piece to this now. Yes. Um, then how will the United States, for one, uh, give up uh, our, our rights as a na our national security rights if we went on to uh, cooperate with the United Nations on this. So. Yes, this, this, is a, this is a worldview issue. That uh, one, one of the things that uh, I discovered after a number of years in practice, that the reason I ended up going back to Harvard Divinity School to study after spending a number of years out practicing law was that, that this is a worldview issue. That, that people don't think about this very often, but the reality is there's a, a spectrum of worldviews that are shared by our human family. Uh, the political manifestation of which, or the political philosophy of which, is you have people who are authoritarians, you have people who are reactionaries, 
You have people who are conservatives. You have people who are moderates. You have people who are liberals. You have people who are progressives. And then you have people who are basically what we refer to as utopianists, uh, who tend to be theological for the most part. But there's a whole eighth worldview. There's an octave of worldviews. And there's a new worldview that is in the offing right now. And that is the worldview that is going to have to be addressed by our human family once we come to acknowledge that there are, in fact, uh, there's a, a super sophisticated, highly intelligent extraterrestrial civilization, and that there may be more than one of these okay, species. But, okay, I'm going to reclaim my time yes. because I wanted to know how to get break through this. Yeah. I, it's I, a new worldview. We have to well, we have to construct well, a new worldview. Well, okay, you're gonna you're suggesting that we're gonna take on a new worldview, if that's what it takes to happen. Uh, huh, we're we're a long way from that, Tony, uh, Mr. Huneos. Well, you know, every so often things happen in the history of the world that change, uh, that lead to a complete change. And um, that was the case when America was discovered and it was called the New World, even though it was part of the same world. But at that time, you know, it completely changed the paradigm of, uh, of, the, of the late medieval period. And there was even discussions whether, you know, maybe the Earth paradise was in America or whether the Native Americans had a soul. It, you know, it was a whole kind of uh, huge discussion. And eventually, obviously, we're here, so it, it worked out. And uh, same thing when uh, the, the atomic bomb was, was released, you know, uh, dropped in Japan. That changed uh, the paradigm of that period. So I think this is the next frontier. And uh, I don't think it's going to be as, as difficult as it seems because uh, we're kind of conditioned already by the, by the media and by the entertainment industry. I mean, <laughs> if, even when I started this, this business, uh, 30, well, such as we could yeah. call it a business, this, this, uh, this uh, beauty, many years ago, it, uh, the attitude of people was, was very negative. Mm -hmm. uh, really, UFOs were considered like a... Like a Cookie okay. subject, you know, and so now it, people that you ask a young generation, for them, he says, "Well, what's the big deal? It's obvious that there's life in the in the in the in the universe." So, I don't know exactly how it will happen, but uh, but it will, and uh, and we will have to adjust and move forward. So, I guess it's a good thing we have the entertainment industry to turn on people's imaginations, Richard. Uh, yes, thank you for this question. It's very important. Uh, I often think, you know, no parent is ever ready for their first child, but they happen anyway. Uh, disclosure of this reality, you know, we may or may not be ready for it. We probably won't be ready for it, frankly. Uh, I think that our society is going through such a tremendous revolution. <clears throat> uh, this isn't 1990, it's certainly not 1950, and so uh, we have capabilities today that I think are forcing this issue out. WikiLeaks didn't exist 10 years ago because it couldn't exist. It wasn't no. a global infrastructure. Uh, cell phone cameras, all of this, this is all new. So I think something's going to happen that's going to force this out front and center. And uh, I, my suspicion, I can only guess, is that those people who have knowledge on this, and I think there are such people, must be aware. They must be aware that they cannot keep this secret forever. I think the wise thing to do would be uh, judiciously and responsibly to begin allowing some of this information out. There, maybe there are controlled leaks today. Um, I do think that when this, ish, this matter is out on the table, that doesn't mean all the answers will be there. It just means that we'll be able publicly, uh, without all you know, joking and ridicule, to be able to talk about it as a public policy issue. Uh, I also think that this will necessitate a geopolitical revolution. You mentioned the issues of U.S. national security. Well, there's other countries in the world, and they're all going to be affected by this. And so it will have to be necessary for there to be a true United Nation, something that actually works that people can um, believe in. Because without that, I, I think it's just going to be a big Do I mess. have any more time? Two minutes. Two minutes. Let's, the, the, the next uh, discussion, I would like to go from, we've, we're worried about airspace. How about cyberspace? So, may I make a comment at this? I'm uh, basically, I mean, my background is I have more combat than virtually anyone you'll ever meet. I have more than 800 combat missions, 860 in jet fighters. Wow. So I'm, I'm not afraid of battle. But Obviously not. I think not. the dumbest thing we could possibly do is weaponize space. And I've been in that argument several times. 
and it, it would be absurd to do that. Thank you. That's Thank you. Good. Enough. Cyberspace. That, uh, it's, One minute it's, it's, is all we it's, have. It's, it's, quite, it's quite clear that the technology that seems to be at the disposal of this civilization is able to access, you know, if the FBI can tap into your internet, and then, then clearly they can too. So they're monitoring, undoubtedly monitoring all the communications that are going on. And I would dare say that there is a process going on of feathering into our culture information, technology, et cetera, that is going to soften this blow that there's a process going on of released information, of, of contact information, et cetera. And I find it, based on 40 years of doing these kind of investigations of Watergate, Iran-Contra, uh, and others uh, that I've been directly involved in, that there's clearly going to be a decision made by very high-level people above all of our pay grades here, I say with all due respect from Congress people, <laughs> that there'll be a decision made to start feathering information into the culture to prepare our people for this rather gradually, which has been going on now for the last 60 years. I think, I, I, I think we're finished. Thank you. I mean, I, yeah. Congresswoman Kilpatrick. Thank you very much. Uh, I think I want to start with the Colonel. I served on the Air Force Academy Board for about six years in my 12-year tenure, 14 years in Congress. Served on the Appropriations Defense Committee, first African-American woman ever to serve there. It's only been three in the history of our 2,000-year country. It's outrageous. Uh, we really believe that women have something to offer. So I really appreciate your service. <laughs> right, right. We come from a let's work this out kind of thing. So we wouldn't have this problem if we, when we control the world. But um, having said that, uh, uh, Colonel, I. I I uh, really appreciate your service, your time, your dedication, 800 plus. I've been all over the world with the uh, Defense Department and it's been quite, quite an experience for me and it's really capitalized and captured my tenure in Congress, really. Why is it that when you were there, you couldn't talk about it? Uh, everything I've read and seen, uh, everybody hush-hushed it. I know, wait, wait, let me do it. I want you to do the whole question. Oh, question. I know, and I know a lot of it's, uh, you know, from the presidential right on down to the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and one of you all spoke to that, and we're going to get back. You didn't call it by that name, but that's kind of what it was uh, that Pr Truman had, exactly, after, as a matter of fact. Why is it now that you're at the table uh, discussing it with us, acknowledging that it is? Probably it's because I'm in my 80s. I now, praise God. Okay. Now, here, is, here is the problem. Any, if you had a government job, you had to have, you need to be what they call humanly reliable. In other words, you had, if you, they thought you were a maniac or something, you'd lose your wings and lose your job and so forth. So anyway, I think it's because of that, the uh, basically the human reliability problem, the, the fact that there, there are some real lunatics in various places and you can't identify them well enough. And, and then they won't submit. Uh, well, you have a problem with next to kin. If they have a, have a child that, that is uh, ill mentally, what do you do? You believe today that as you sit here with us and former members of Congress, 80 plus years of uh, experience, having uh, now before this committee whose time has come, uh, since 1968, there's been no hearing, as you know. We're moving to that. And I don't know that the answer is a, another hearing right now. I'm afraid for that. Um, it, I heard in this discussion this morning, there's a lot of private things going on. I like to see partnerships, private, public. I think that's when Americans get our best bet when we come together as a nation in a private, public kind of atmosphere. Um, when you talk about what you just said, and I agree that it's urgent. I think somebody at the table mentioned coming together and acknowledging it, that which we haven't done as this country. Other countries are beginning to do that, and some were mentioned this morning. Um, do you think the Air Force will ever come to that point? And is it a domestic, an international partnership that we need? How, how, how would you begin it? You know, you come with the credibility. I think it's necessary, and I don't think we got much choice. Something's got to be done. Right. So, and you all have to help us formulate that, too. I agree with that. Thank you very much for your service. Uh, Mr. Sheehan, you talked about which is worse. That's how you ended that dynamic presentation that you had. Which is, which, which is worse? Do we try to put this together and save ourselves with the world? 
or do we continue to put our heads in the sand that it doesn't exist and you know that it does? I, I'm, I'm at a loss. I, yes. You all are giving us good information, and we, I think um, those in the audience want us to come up with some kind of recommendation. It, I, it, and I can't have it both ways. You've got to be solid. It, with it's, it. it's, a very, it's a very difficult issue in that in the, because of the, the job assignments, when, when a person is a congressional representative, for example, and has the duty of representing her or his congressional district in the interests that are there, it's a job. And as you know, a, a significant number of the Congress people are lawyers. They view themselves as representing a certain client base. And the problem is, is that we represent, if we represent a nation state, and we insist upon maintaining the, the special privilege of our citizens, the, pers the special access we have to resources in the world, et cetera, even to the detriment of other, other nation states, we're still at a level of consciousness okay. that is very dangerous. Stop. Talking too much. Yeah. Break it down for me. You okay. gotta get me, give me two, three points. I mean, we don't have a lot we're, of time. And I love everything you've said. Yeah. But don't give it to me back yet. We gotta have something to hold on to when you we're, we're, we're going to we're going to have to yield some of our national sovereignty to an inner to a global body like the United Nations. Okay, right there. We're not doing that. I mean we got no. leadership presidents now who don't even acknowledge that it exists. So we're not gonna yield anything. Yeah. It's gotta be approached to it. Maybe we do it better because we're former elected officials, public policy makers. Can't say it like that because the wall goes up and you don't get past it. Yeah. It's got to be a better way to say that and begin to do some of what you suggest. And, and it'll, it'll come probably through religious communities, that the, the altering of consciousness with regard to an angelic realm, a, an other dimension of reality, that's where most people categorize these types of discussions. Okay, and that's where you worked with the Jesuit yes. Yes. Uh, Coordination Coalition. That's I think right. that's, a good, that's a good start. That's I right. think you can't leave out private industry. I think you can't leave out the universities. I mean, yeah. it's got to be a major coalition of things and institutions in our country and around yeah. the world that would come together more than one time with experts like yourselves and yeah. laymen like us and others who have interest in the issue because it is a world phenomenon. And if we keep acting like it doesn't exist, then we all lose, the world loses. That's right. So, you know, I, I, I think time is urgent I, and I'm very new at the issue, so I'm, I'm just learning it. Even as a member of the Appropriations Armed Service Committee, we tacitly touched it but then it goes away, yeah. even at the academy where we outstanding young men and women who dedicate their lives to this country. Uh, and they have some things that they look at and then it's put away. It's, it's, in, the, it's in the Air Force Academy uh, Exactly, book, exactly uh, talking right. Talking about how to, how to address exactly. UFOs. Exactly, exactly. I was going to go to the Air Force Do you feel academy. the urgency? Yeah. Do you all feel the urgency? And I'm going to ask, um, yeah. I'm going to say your name wrong. Thank you very much, Mr. Sheehan. The, is there urgency here or are we just here just, just talking? Normally, people have put it away. I mean, officially, right, governments. But I, I think in a way there is, because the potential uh, is, is, it has a very good potential. Like I said in my statement, it could really do the trick that, anything el that everything else has failed. You know, what do we do in this earth? We have tremendous problems uh, besides this issue. Uh, environmental problems, uh, and hunger, and so on, you know. And uh, somehow we don't seem to be able to deal with them as a, as a, as a world society. There's just too much um, fight, fighting and, uh, and ideological differences and religious differences. The issue of religious is, is very important. Look at all the recent uh, problems we've, we've had internationally, you know, uh, with certain factions of the Islamic religion and all that. In fact, I wrote an article in, in the magazine about uh, UFOs and Islam. And, uh, and with, which was, was quite interesting for me to, to research that. And like all religions, you know, we, again, you have many factions within a religion. Uh, I do agree with, with, with uh, Daniel. Probably if, if the Pope and, uh, and other religious figures, they might be the, the way to do it. That, that may do the trick uh, rather than the political will because you know how politics are. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, you know better than, than we do how okay. things are getting well, very difficult. Well, I see I have difficult. a minute left. Thank you uh -huh. very much for that. Just, just in kind of summary, trying to understand it. As an appropriator, 12 years on the Federal Appropriations Committee with a budget of nearly $3 trillion, biggest being the armed services of $700 billion. Now we're on our knees. We don't have the money for this or that. Could this possibly be something that can save our budget, get more resources, make it universal? 
offer some kind of, I'm looking at it from an appropriations point, there's got to be some coming together. We spent a lot of money doing a lot of things that never happened. Qu quick answer, I sit yes. here as an appropriator looking for dollars to help save America first and incidentally help the rest of the world. Sorry to interrupt there. Anything that can allow an object to loiter indefinitely, in instantly accelerate, and do it all silently is using something better than petroleum for moving around. So there, there must be, whatever that answer is, there must be something implicit in the reality of this phenomenon that will actually be a game changer. And that's, that's really the one hope. We've got everything so messed up in every other way looking at the world. We're not cooperating, we're fighting. But if, if this is real, if there is an a energy paradigm solution here in the UFO phenomenon, that by itself is worth every single effort that we can make to get that out in the open. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Senator Gravel. Let me point out that it's not only uh, the problem of the Congress, it's the problem of the American people which has been propagandized by the Congress and its leadership, that we are superior as Americans to anybody else in the world. That's the problem. If we're gonna have a global community, we must put our humanness first before our nationality. And, and what, what the testimony that I read is that you're talking about a paradigm change in global governance. Now, let me ask this as a favor to you, to us, uh, for this immediate hearing. Would you, Antonio, get together with Daniel and the others and draft, draft a resolution that we could decide upon at the end of the hearings on Friday to recommend the creation of a United Nations agency using the Granada precedent and already the numbers, uh, the resolutions that have been. So you draft that, and it's, it's not, doesn't have to be 20 pages, it can be one page, maybe two paragraphs. You draft this so that we can get our hands around something uh, in this regard. And then we'll have to make a decision, are we prepared as former public officials, as private citizens, to put our money where our mouth is, and that is to be globalist before we become nationalist. And that's the answer. Yes. So if you could provide us with that document, we'd be deeply in your debt as uh, on this side of the table. And I, I, would I could start that a little bit because there's a, there's a provision in the United Nations which is called the Unite, Uniting for Peace Resolution. And Henry Kissinger told us about this in Gov 180 at Harvard College, and he said, if the world population ever finds out about this, we are all in trouble, he said. I was kind of wondering who he meant and, by And we. he's right. Yeah, the that's government, right. The leadership is going to be in trouble once the people wake up. That's right. But you need a device. Yeah. And right now, the device is the knowledge that you're bringing forward that we're trying to observe here. So first... Would you bring that resolution as soon as you can? Surely. We'll circulate it among the members uh, and the leadership of the Paradigm yeah. Research Group yeah, we can do that. to seek their we'll be glad to Now, the question I would ask, uh, Mr. Dolan, uh, you mentioned uh, that the compendium of documents that you're aware of uh, has come about through Freedom of Information Act, has come about by accident in many regards. Is there anything out there that, that document-wise backs up the Roswell incident, that is the crash and the humanoids. Is there any document that we could get, hand, put our hands on? Yeah, yes, sir. There are, there are a few very interesting documents. Even uh, <clears throat> as early as July 1947, FBI, uh, which was involved in, re in investigating the so-called flying saucers very actively, had a memo indicating that um, the uh, debris or whatever was recovered at Roswell was being transferred to Wright Field, Dayton, Ohio, uh, U.S. Air Force headquarters. Uh, I think that's rather interesting. Whatever this was, if it was some kind of balloon apparatus, I think we could ask why, why would that be transferred to, to Wright Field. So that's interesting. There, there are a number of other um, documents that talk about rumors within the military discussions of um, 
There's, yeah, that's yeah. not good enough to right. No, no, that's, because that's it's hearsay. But regarding yeah. Ros, there was in back in 1994, the General Accounting Office of Congress was was tasked with looking into the Roswell incident. All right, and um, this was on the initiative of the late Representative Stephen Schiff of New Mexico, whose constituents asked him to do this, and he and he did. Uh, Schiff talked about this at length, about how the Air Force and the Pentagon just stonewalled him, Got, gave him nothing, gave him a lot of expletives as well uh, in the process. But what the GAO's investigation was that the relevant records at Roswell from uh, the end of 1946 into, I think, 1948, 49, were gone. All of the records that they were looking for, that they expected to find, were, surprise, not there. And uh, there was no explanation given. These were records, according to the GAO, that should not have been uh, element, ever re removed. They were permanent, but they were, they were gone. And the Air Force, by the way, was very, very deft in their handling of this, because while the GAO investigation was going on, the United States Air Force took the initiative and did their own study, quote, unquote, study, in which they beat the GAO to the punch in terms of publicity, got their own thing out there, and said, oh, yeah, it was a classified balloon project known as Mogul, which was designed to test to see whether the Soviets were detonating their own atomic devices. Uh, it's a big, big fat report. It looks very impressive. When you actually read it, it's a, it's a load of fluff, in my opinion. But that was their explanation. They beat the GAO to the punch, and so they won the PR war. Good, thank you. Uh, Mr. Sheehan, uh, would you address uh, briefly what is the theological implication? Ah, the, the, Briefly. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it, co coming, coming to grips with the full import of the theological reality uh, is what undergirds all of this, is that for, for each of us to recognize that we are incarnated in, uh, in a material form, but that there are other vibrational frequencies at which there are other dimensions of reality going on at the same time. Uh, our, our theology is the realm in which we deal with it. It's a category of, of uh, knowledge in the human family in which we deal with other dimensions of reality. What happens after death? Uh, how did we get here? What are we doing here? What's our ultimate purpose? These are things that are raised by the UFO issue. And that's why I, I reiterate that it's theology, it's in the realm of theology that we have to come to address this. And when we, when we do, what we're going to discover is that we're going to draw down into our culture a lot of those same realities that, for example, the Native American culture and some of the Aboriginal cultures understand, that they are in a dynamic relationship with other dimensions, other vibrational frequencies. Uh, and that, that our culture, our culture has closed itself off from that, from the, from the time of the Enlightenment, in trying to define ourselves as separated, individuated, intellectual beings, and that we're not in a harmonious, uh, in in uh, in balanced relationship with the rest of reality. The consequences, of course, are falling upon us now because of the global climate change that we're experiencing the contamination of our environment by ourselves. And this is the crisis, I think one of the crises that's going to confront us. And that my sense is that we're going to become much more, if we probe into the theology of all of this, we're going to come to have a much more profound appreciation for the Native American culture and the, the theology of the Native American culture and the faculty of, of <laughs> intuitional perception that our human family has, which is a, a faculty that's evolving uh, teleologically in our culture. And this is what Tehard de Chardin has dealt with it within the Jesuits. It's, a, it's the cutting edge of modern theology and the insights that we've gained now through quantum physics since 1923 to 1926. We have to integrate into our scientific worldview the insights of quantum physics. And we have to begin to readjust our basic worldview, as I pointed out before, to evolve a new worldview that integrates these capabilities. Thank you very much. I yield back the balance of my time. <laughs> Congressman Cook. I would like to start uh, by asking uh, Colonel French. You were involved in the uh, an initiations of the uh, Blue Book processes. Yes. Could you elaborate a little more on what you found out from that, and especially 
so I have a better understanding of how that uh, got stopped or discarded or, or what exactly happened on the Blue Book. And, and how long did that go on? I just have, need a better I'd understanding like to throw of that. you a curve if you don't mind too much. But uh, they ask about what happened to the the uh, results of the accident at uh, Almogordo. Yeah. Well, all of that, that uh, was taken to what is called the Foreign Technology Division at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. And what was shipped, there was physical debris, uh, actually parts of some kind of airplane. Another unusual aspect of it was, uh, though the metal wasn't, it wasn't any thicker than cellophane. I mean, just, but you put it in your hand and you crush it together and it flops right back into shape. We had it analyzed, it didn't come from Earth. There's no known, we have no known source of whatever that metal was. You had that Yes. You, you've actually uh, held some of that. Uh, yeah. And so has uh, Marcel. Jesse Marcel did the okay. same thing. And, uh, and I understand from, uh, from the Roswell, basically, yeah. what's generally called the Roswell incident. Uh, I realize there were several different yeah. locations of materials gathered up. Yeah. Um, there were dozens and dozens of witnesses on the materials. And you're clearly one of them, and one of the, uh, you know, at least in terms of the analysis of the materials, yeah. not necessarily gathering them up. But tell us about, were there witnesses of any, uh, as has been referred to as a humanoid? Oh, yes. But, but were, yeah. and, and who, because you don't hear nearly as they much also, about that, but could you They also were taken to the Foreign Technology Division. There were, uh, if I remember, it was about eight or nine corpses. That, and, okay. uh, and I'm more interested right now in the witnesses to that. To the, I've, I've read the accounts, but who well, were the, I, there I were many witnesses I, of material. I can't but, point you to anyone in, that can add to that except uh, uh, Marcel. Okay. Because he, he was the first one to pick it up. Went but, out to the crash, policed up the pieces of the airplane, and there were specific markings on them, like they were identification numbers for parts or something of right. that nature. But it would look like, rather like Arabic writing. It didn't look like anything from our part of the, our neck know, of the woods. Did Marcel indicate that he had actually witnessed the humanoid part? I know he witnessed the, uh, the answer over here. Well, and please, if anybody can illuminate. Well, there, first of all, there are, there are quite many, many witnesses, of course, who've gone on the record about Roswell. Unfortunately, we'll have a Roswell panel here uh, oh, okay. during, during I, this maybe week. I'm, yeah. Okay. And there are a number of uh, researchers who've specialized in that. My but question was, it started off as the Blue Book. But then it <laughs> Blue, Blue Book was the U.S. Air Force official uh, public investigative body of UFOs from uh, 1940. Actually, it was it was a successor of a couple of previous ones. Started in 1952, went up to 1969 when it was closed down. Okay, but it did include some of the Roswell stuff. It included nothing in Roswell, the Blue Book. There, there, no, there's nothing okay, on Roswell. So, okay, so okay. that was, okay, well, I just, I'd ask about the Blue Book and... And nothing that I ever. What did you say it was uh, closed down, and what was the reason for Not, that? The end of 1969. Well, what happened in the 1960s is that the United States had a big, big wave of UFO sightings. 1965, 66 made the news. Gerald Ford, Congressman in Michigan, talked about it on the on a on the floor of Congress. His constituents had seen UFOs, and he was not satisfied with the answers that were coming from the Air Force. And the pressure was really on the United States Air Force to do something about this. They, they, it's hard to, to remember because it's so far back in time, but the Air Force was losing a lot of credibility on this. A lot of people were not believing the Air Force explanations and swamp gas became a big national joke at that time. And so really all the Air Force wanted to do was just get rid of UFOs. And so what they ended up doing was they contracted with the University of Colorado to conduct what was to be the, the first true public scientific investigation of UFOs. And, and the whole attitude was, whatever Colorado comes up with, that's what we're gonna conclude. Okay. And what, what that, that study did is they, that, that was a whole big mess and half the scientists got fired midway through the project because they were believers. The, the man running it, Edward Condon, was absolutely dead set against any kind of pro-UFO, uh, pro-ET. 
So based on that recommendation, the Air Force was able to wash their hands, say, thank you very much, and they said, we're out of the business. We're not doing this anymore. And you're, there's no way to retrieve any of the, I just gotta make sure I understand this. And I appreciate, because you've illuminated this greatly for me. But is there any way to find out exactly what was in the Blue Book at this point then? I mean, I'm, I'm looking yeah. for... Yes, yes. I mean... Well, the Blue Book uh, files are... They, they they're, they're still there. They were just saying they're absolutely being covered up? No, no. The no, Blue no. Book they're files now, are released. Oh, we can still yes. read those. Okay, well, I was but, uh, confused the problem, on that issue. The problem is... Uh, yeah, and them. the problem is okay. the Roswell stuff is not in the Blue Book files. I, okay, yeah. now I've got a better and, understanding of all that. And in the, in the prior panel, uh, Stanton Friedman referred to a memo by a, a General Carol Bollander in which he, he stated, in closing Blue Book down in 1969, that UFO reports affecting national security were not part of the Blue Book system. Okay. So Blue Book... I do remember him yeah, saying yeah, that. Yeah. <clears throat> if I could turn to uh, Mr. Huneus and uh, Mr. Sheehan, religion has been brought up and implied uh, in terms of this whole thing several ways. And um, <clears throat> now you're not trying to say that just because uh, Pat Robertson has a particular view or because uh, popes in the past have said things that clearly don't agree with what you're saying as a Jesuit. Right, right. That religion is somehow against the idea of extraterrestrial life. No, in, in, in fact, it's quite the contrary. That Remember, re religion, religero, uh, the Latin derivative of religero is to relink. The whole idea of relinking uh, the intellect, intellectus, the, the root of intellect is intellectus, the ability to distinguish the difference between that whole ability that we develop somewhere between Australopithecus and Homo erectus, this intellectual capacity, we alienated ourselves in a separate entity here behind our eyeballs from all of the rest of reality. Sure. But That's the I'm, danger. Okay, and, but I'm going to kind of adjust yeah. this a little yeah. bit. Was there an implication that it's more of the, uh, well, let me just say this, going to Christian religions in specific, uh -huh. you think there's some bias against the belief in extraterrestrial, because uh, you were talking about maybe we're going to have to accept no, this from a different religious perspective or something. No, I, I think that within, within one of the features, the unique features of, of Catholic Christology, for example, is each of the worldviews that I'd pointed out yeah, yeah. that have political implications, there are subsets of Catholic and, and Christian right. theology in all of those. Of so there's a reactionary worldview that is fundamentalist that everything is divided into good guys and bad guys, and there's Satan in, in angelic realms, and they've projected this satanic reality that they have onto extraterrestrials, which is very, very dangerous. Okay. Well, I, I would, you know, I'm not uh, in any way here to do missionary work for my particular yeah. religious faith, yeah. or certainly to speak for my religious faith. I'm a Mormon. Uh, but on a fundamental level, many Mormons believe it's consistent with doctrines of the church that there is well, life what's an official doctrine outside of, the uh, It's an, the official, do, it's an official doctrine yeah. of the Church of the Latter-day Saints, yeah. the yeah. actual belief in extraterrestrial intelligence. Well, I, and I wanted to make that point clear. Yeah, Again, yeah. I'm not here for that no, to, no, but it's true. to preach or anything but like that. But it is true. But I'm, I'm also, I, I think, and, and I think most Mormons believe as I do on that, yes. would still say, that's still a leap to say that we've had the visitation. And, and there's nothing in a religious sense that would prohibit that. Right. But we need as strong an evidence as we can to help this panel open up some congressional hearings. And by the way, I'm not giving up on the United States Congress yet. Yeah, I don't no. think we have to go to the United no, no. Nations. Maybe yeah. that might be a way. But let's also try to open this up at the United States Congress. Yes, level. I agree. You asked, you asked a question, you asked a question more about that. The Catholic position on all this. Well, my grandmother's a Catholic. That's all I have to do with the Catholic Church. However, it's very important, one thing that the Catholic Church has done, and believe it or not, they commissioned the building of a wide-angle lens to search the skies for inbound UFOs. It's in Tucson, Arizona, believe it or not. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you very much. Congresswoman Hooley? What kind of 
I mean, the reaction over the last 30, 40 years in the United States, what, what's the reaction and what's, what has happened in the rest of the world? What's going on? Have there been sightings? Do they feel differently about it than we, you know, a lot of people feel about it here? What, what's happening elsewhere? Well, uh, as I said in my statement, uh, the one thing that I think even skeptics would have to agree is that the UFO phenomenon is worldwide. It doesn't matter. I mean, it doesn't matter the religion, it doesn't matter the ethnic, ethnic origin, the language, the culture. It has been reported all <coughs> over the world. Now, there are some sociological uh, differences, as you would expect right. from different cultures, but um, we see uh, there's a quite a rich history of uh, UFO, in, even UFO investigations, official investigations, and we will be discussing this in, in uh, in, in a few more sessions uh, during this week about investigations. And we have, in fact, uh, with us, some uh, members from some of the South American uh, agencies. Uh, so we've seen an opening uh, in recent years, uh, particularly in some European countries and, uh, and particularly in South America. Now, uh, odd as it may seem, it almost seems to be good politics now in South America to have a UFO investigation. <laughs> uh, I know it sounds <laughs> awkward, but uh, the Latin culture is uh, more, obviously more open. Uh, there's uh, much less ridicule uh, in the media and all that about this phenomenon. And so we've seen a trend. It started with uh, Uruguay back in the late 70s, and we have a representative that will be speaking later in this week. And then uh, Chile, uh, Peru, Ecuador, Brazil, uh, Argentina recently announced the creation of a, of a UFO agency within the Air Force. What is interesting about the South American approach to this phenomenon from an official point of view is that there is not an adversarial relationship between the official uh, military agencies and the civilian UFO committees or UFO groups. It, totally different from the United States, where we, uh, even in the days of Blue Book, there was always a big fight between uh, ufologists, civilian ufologists, and the Air Force. That was classic, you know, if you read the history of UFOs in, in the United States. But in South America, and it used to be a little bit like that too in South America, not as bad as here. But now, uh, you see that they cooperate. And they usually what happens is because a lot of these agencies, they have a limited budget, a small budget. Right. So they call for volunteers from the civilian community. And that, cre that shows us a model. We don't have to have an adversarial. We don't have to fight the government. This is a mystery. We should all work together in order to solve this mystery. So that, that's uh, at least some of what is going on. Um, but even Russia has had a lot of official investigations. Even under the Soviet Union, there were committees uh, from the, um, there were actually two committees that were, that were going on in the late 70s and 80s. One was a public one uh, through the Soviet Academy of Sciences, and the other one was a secret one uh, by the KGB and the Ministry of Defense, the Soviet military. Um, nobody knew about that one publicly, but the scientific one was or even officially revealed even in the controlled Soviet media. And then, of course, under Gorbachev in the 1980s, Glasnost, it opened up, and the UFO phenomenon became very, very popular in, uh, in, 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 in the late Soviet society and in, into modern Russia. So uh, China has had kind of a semi-official uh, organization called the China UFO Research Organization. We, we have one of its founding uh, members here also attending this hearing. So yes, it, it, you see it all over the world. And in other countries actually have a more open attitude, I mean officially. So it, it provides a model also for the US, in my opinion. For any of the panelists, um the other question I have, one of the other questions I have is, a lot of people, when they talk about this, at least in this country, are ridiculed when they talk about it. This is, you know, poo you're, you know, you're somewhere in outer space. What, why, I guess, has there been some organization or is it just, our attitudes in the United States. Tell me why there's so much skepticism in this country. 
uh, I'll, I'll feel, I'll try to feel that. <clears throat> I do find privately people are much more open about this than they are when they're in a public situation. That's one right. thing. People discover that uh, probably any of these researchers and they discover, oh, you research UFOs, inevitably they will say, oh, let me tell you about what I saw last year, five years, 20 years ago. So those stories are out there and people, I, I firmly believe there is a true hunger for knowledge on this once people realize that there's something to it. But I agree with you, um, in our public discourse, this is a, a third rail. Uh, whether you are in uh, major media or politics or academia, uh, they're all really the same in this regard. I had a professor at UCLA call me a number of years ago, a department chair said, well, I really just wanna let you know I enjoy your books. I said, thank you, why are you whispering in the phone? <laughs> Which literally he was whispering, and you know, he said the typical thing that every professor would say, well, my department's kind of political and, you know, not go. Right, so uh, they, it's always the retired ones who, who look for me. But um, personally, I, I believe, you know, the, 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 to the tone was set back in the 50s, and uh, in fact, the, the top skeptic debunker in the U.S. at that time was a Harvard astronomer by the name of Donald Menzel. Um, Menzel wrote a number of books. He was like the, the, the pit bull guard dog maintaining orthodoxy. Uh, there, you know, if some little community college professor was going to get out of line and talk about UFOs, here's Menzel, Harvard astronomer, who's going to argue with Menzel? And he'd slap them down. Menzel, we learned years later, had a very, very close relationship with the National Security Agency. Very close. Uh, does this prove that the NSA used him? in this capacity, who knows? But these things, this is how it looks. Back in uh, the late 1970s, journalist Carl Bernstein had the famous Rolling Stone article uh, in which he said there are over 400 US journalists that I have identified who had a covert relationship with the Central Intelligence Agency. Uh, CIA promptly said, well, we don't, we don't do that anymore. And if you read their language carefully in their statements, especially in the 1990s, they're very lawyerly in their denials. It's very clear that there are relationships. So what I am suggesting, and I guess this is the uh, conspiracy angle here, but I, I would suggest that there are uh, proxies that work with national security elements. Look, it's an open revolving door in much of our society anyway. Uh, most of this is out in the open, but I think that there are relationships friendly relationships uh, with academic and with media and uh, political as well, where, where you have uh, the herders who basically keep the underlings in line. And every now and then someone gets out of line and they have to be dealt with. But, so I think that that's where the culture is created and it has a top-down effect. And most people, they don't wanna be Superman. They, just, they have their jobs, they've got their family, they got their things, they can't fight the machine. So they just, uh, they live their lives and hope that someone else takes it on. And, and there, there are documents that, that uh, Mr. Dolan can tell you about, the internal documents in the Air Force and others where they consciously instruct their officers to ridicule and debunk people. It's a specific official policy inside the Air Force. The people they know positively have seen one of these things to try to destroy their credibility. It, yeah. It, yeah. In the, the Robertson panel, which is a famous um, CIA uh, symposium that took place in uh, January of 1953, uh, in fact, they used the word debunk. Uh, 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 yeah. It's in the document itself. As the colonel says, you know, specifically assigned to go out and ridicule them and tell them they're ridiculous. And most people can't stand up against that kind of thing coming from authority figures. Right. The Robertson panel was, was the last act of the Truman administration. It was the last weekend of Harry Truman's presidency that this classified panel took place, and it was specifically related to UFOs. Very interesting little f historical factoid there. And as uh, Daniel just pointed out, its conclusion was this is a necessary topic and we must debunk it to the American people. This is not a good thing for them to be uh, thinking about. Oh, thank you. And they're thank working with much. the media to do that. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, from where was the balloon, the mogul balloon that was supposed to have been the Roswell incident, from where was it supposedly launched? The, yeah, the mogul, they, they, I thought they were at White Sands, Alamogordo, that area. We, we have the record. Oh, I'm yeah. so sorry. From where? 
You know what a pie ball is? It's, it's a high altitude balloon that they track. They launch them and then track them so they can keep track of the upper air currents. But that, if when it was launched, when uh, Marcel launched the thing, he would have been probably standing right in front of base ops because that's where they send them up from. From where? Base operations. <coughs> you see the fighter squadrons or bomber squadrons or whatever, they have their own particular area, but transient airplanes always launch from base operations. How close is one of those to Roswell? It's on Roswell base. So they're, what they're saying is that the balloon was launched there and crashed there? Yes. Well, I, I, don't, I don't know where exactly that it crashed. See, these balloons were supposed to be determining uh, possible uh, Soviet uh, nuclear detonations. Uh, I'm just curious where they thought, because if it was launched somewhere else, the probability of it landing at Roswell was, was vanishingly small. You know, I had a course in, in advanced statistics, and it's vanishingly small probability. Sir, the, uh, the United States Air Force in their 1994 reports said these were launched out of White Sands. And, um, you know, and they, actually they had a, a, a schedule of, of a number of these balloon launches that uh, went down and were recovered. So there were several that were from um, the spring of 1947, and in fact they uh, speculated that this wasn't really a slam dunk, but they, they indicated that, the, um, that they thought that they'd identified the one launch that was in fact supposedly the Roswell crash. I'm trying to remember the date on that. You know, as, as has been mentioned, the curious thing about all of this is in the GAO report, there was nothing for them to look at because all of the relevant information had been destroyed. They had no idea at whose uh, command it had been destroyed. And you know, this is very unorthodox. It should have been there. Mm -hmm. Kind of interesting, isn't it? Well, I was a uh, member of the, uh, the of the Science and Technology Committee. I think it was simply called the Science Committee then. When uh, Schiff held this uh, I thought it was a hearing, apparently it was a briefing, and it was what, about 94 or five, I came to the Congress in 93, and I remember his, his interest in that. When I was first approached about uh, this week's activities, I was cautioned that if you do this, you could uh, possibly be relegated to the lunatic fringe, and this may not be good for, uh, for your potential activities for the rest of your uh, political productive life. I'm, 87 in five weeks, so I don't know how much remains anyhow. <laughs> but I said, you know, I, I'm going to do this because I think there's a constitutional, a very serious constitutional issue involved here. Whether uh, there are uh, UFOs or not, whether they are extraterrestrial or not is really quite irrelevant to whether or not there ought to be hearings on this because the First Amendment to the Constitution says the right of the people to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Mr. Sheehan, doesn't this fall in, within that? Oh yes, there, yes. There's, there's, no, there's no doubt about this. Uh, the, but but the, the, fact, the fact of the matter is, in a national security state, from, from the passage of the National Security Act of 1947, there has been an entire caveat on the Constitution that things that fall under national security, and when Oliver North can sit right in front of you and say, sure, I lied to you, the, the Congress, because this was a covert operation. You know, that we're in charge, you're not in charge. And so there's, a, there's an entire national security state kind of uh, subculture that believes that they have the right not only to hold information back from Congress, but to openly defy Congress. When you pass the Boland Amendment, prohibiting them from engaging in the covert operations against Nicaragua, they go ahead and do it anyhow. The danger is a national security state, and if it arose in the context of the Cold War with the Soviet Union, we should move very aggressively at the end of the Cold War to try to disassemble some of those structures of the national security state, not try to create a new one so that they went searching very quickly for some ultimate other that they had to find, and they ended up having you know, Afghanistan, or Iran, or Iraq. It's a, it's a mindset, and, and it's that, that whole kind of retrenchment into a defensive position in the face of the ultimate other. And it's, a, it's an ultimate mindset that we have to try to overcome, and as I point out, that it's a, it's a theological issue, because that is a, is a, a malfunction of our intellect.
And it cuts us off from our, our harmonious relationship, not only with the rest of the universe, but all other intelligent species in the universe. And that's, that's what we have to address, I think. It's a worldview issue. For, thank you. For 20 years in the uh, Congress, I served on the Armed Services Committee, and I remembered Eisenhower's caution as he left office <laughs> that we should be concerned about the military-industrial complex. I understand that in the original draft, it was military-industrial-congressional complex. And he didn't, he didn't want to be too political, so he took out the congressional. It's too bad he did that, because this really is a military-industrial-congressional complex. The F-35 is built in, in 48 states. There are 96 senators, and I don't know how many hundred representatives to support the F-35, not because we may need it, but because it creates jobs. Yeah. And you know, too many of us cannot, make, cannot differentiate for, between jobs that consume wealth and jobs that create yeah. wealth. Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 on the, it's on the front page of the Washington Post today. You look at the headlines of the Washington Post and it says that the sequester of kind of yeah. cut back on the military budget, the, all the arguments are coming out now, we can't do that because of all the jobs and the employment. You know, I mean, it's an old, it's an old saw. We've developed a, a, an economy that is so reliant upon military spending that in fact it drives the policies to the, you go looking for adversaries. And if we lose the adversary of the Soviet Union on December 31st of 1991 with the dissolving of the Soviet Union, that takes them less than a few years to find another one. And if you have to go so desperately that you're looking to Afghanistan and, and Iran as being your ultimate threat to the most powerful nation in the history of the human civilization, there's a motive for that, and it's not because they're threatening you. When we, we had a hearing on this in the Congress about the economic effects, I wouldn't have, if I was chairman, I wouldn't have held the hearing, economic effects of sequestration. And when it came time for my question, my five minutes, I said, suppose when we left here tonight, we broke all the windows out of this building. And we did that all over Washington. And overnight, a crew came in and replaced all of those broken windows. And we did this every day. We broke out all the windows and the crew would replace them all. Wouldn't that create a lot of jobs? Just think of the jobs that that would create. You know, I, and my question was, do you think that would have a long-term beneficial effect on the economy? I wanted them to understand the difference between jobs that create wealth and jobs that consume wealth. Well, we've been talking about the Constitution and why I'm here. I'm here because I think that the Congress owes the American people a hearing on this subject. That's right. Okay. Absolutely. You may be dead wrong. There may be nothing to UFOs. That is irrelevant. No. You have a right to petition the government for redress of grievances. All of my questions have been anticipated by my colleagues. Thank you all very much for a very uh, good panel. And we'll now stand in recess for lunch. Thank you. Thank you.